Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the fourth Google Apps for Education Extra Credit webinar. My name is Jason Cook. I'm a member of the Google Apps team based here in Seattle. I'm joined on the line today by my Google colleague, Steve Bucci, who is based in Mountain View. Our featured speaker today is Brad Stark, Cloud Solutions Architect at Aperio Inc., one of our leading Google Enterprise partners. Brad has worked on a variety of deployment projects, ranging from the City of Los Angeles to Brown University, so we're very glad that he can be here today to share some veteran advice about how to run a smooth Google Apps deployment. Uh, a couple quick notes regarding logistics. We will do Q&A at the end of the presentation, so if you have any questions as we go along, please just send them to me in the chat window, and I will uh, queue those up for the Q&A period. Um, I'm also going to push out uh, telephone dial information, so if anyone experiences issues with the WebEx audio stream, you can always dial in via phone as well. Um, without any further ado, uh, let me pass the mic to Brad, and that's it. Well, thank you, Jason. Um, so, uh, greetings, everyone. Thanks for making a little bit of time today. I um, want to spend some time talking about uh, Google Apps deployments that we've done in the enterprise space and some of the larger EDU deployments as well, and talk about how some of the things are similar and some things are different between the two. Uh, before I dig in, though, a little bit of background on myself. First of all, I'm obviously thinking ahead to next year because uh, my slides here are dated to 2011. So, um, you know, I've got to be a forward, forward looking here. A little bit about myself. I've uh, been in IT for about 30 years now. I've been with um, previously with Intel Corporation in their IT group. I did a Google Apps pilot with them. Joined Aperio about three years ago, and uh, have worked as a technical consultant, doing hands-on work for the deployments as well as project management. My current role is a solutions architect, so I work with our customers to understand where they are today and where they want to get to, and then map the path between the two. So I spend a lot of time talking to larger educational institutions certainly nonprofits, as well as our enterprise customers, you know, understanding their needs um, as we deploy Google Apps both on the messaging and on the collaboration side. Uh, just a little bit about Aperio before we dig in. We've been around about four years now. Now we have over 180 different large projects that we've done of 5,000 customers for various products that we do. Um, our, our mission is to help enterprises accelerate adoption of the cloud. We're an entirely cloud-based company, um, and we try to get our customers to move generally in that direction. We work with three different platforms, Salesforce.com, of course, Google Apps. Google Apps specifically, we were the first and I believe still the largest of the Google Apps partners. Um, we also do some work with Workday, Amazon Web Services, et cetera. What I'd have you know here is that 100% cloud. Mostly what I want to start by talking about today is some of the enterprise deployments that we've done and draw some parallels um, and, uh, between them and some of the EDU deployments that we've worked on as well. Some things certainly that have been different or unique about different enterprise deployments I think have a lot of bearing um, in the EDU space as well. So I want to spend a little bit of time here just talking about some of the deployments that have been done and some of the unique characteristics of each of those deployments. So here on this slide, I've got kind of six different um, of the large number of ones that we've worked on. And I picked these because each of them had a slightly different approach. And that's, so I guess that would be the first message that I'd want you guys to get is everybody takes a slightly different approach to how they deploy Google Apps. And there's a number of choices that you make early on in the project that kind of govern how you're going to deploy. So I want to talk briefly about each of these different six and some of the unique things around them before we dig into more about, um, general information about enterprise deployments and how they link to EDU deployments. So some of the things that were unique about each of these. Um, District of Columbia. Um, generally, we, most Google Apps deployments lead with messaging and follow with collaboration. And you'll hear this theme again as I move through more material later. District of Columbia went the other way around. They actually led with the collaboration side, Google Docs, Sheets, and presentations, and then later followed with mail. It's not an approach we typically see. Usually you lead with messaging right, and then follow with uh, the collaboration stuff. And I'll certainly talk more about that later. Another interesting thing at District of Columbia was a very heavily entrenched group of Outlook Exchange users. They really liked their Outlook. So evangelizing the web UI as we move people to the cloud, certainly for the mail engine and Google Apps engine, 
but having them really get the best experience with Google Apps by using the web UI as opposed to staying with their client was certainly a challenge at District of Columbia. Um, one of the best ways to do that is simply to evangelize the goodness that is the web UI. Um, and then slowly you can help people kind of move their personal workflows from Outlook or whatever other tools they're using today over into the web-based environment. Again, I'll talk more about this when I talk about training and the importance of, of that as not just a knowledge transfer mechanism, but also to uh, evangelizing the solution and helping people move their uh, workflows. Second one on my list here would be City of LA. Um, very large deployment, 30,000 users, a very politically charged environment. I think what was interesting about this one was they were coming off of group-wise. Certainly we've worked with and seen customers moving from Exchange, lots of Lotus Notes, group-wise. In the EDU space, we often see Meeting Maker. You'll see Sun Messaging. Um, there's a great um, path for almost any legacy platform into Google Apps. Of course, Google provides superlative tools for you know, an exchange migration or a notes migration. I just want you to be aware that there are tools out there for other source systems as well, and I used uh, GroupWise as the example here. Motorola, the next one on my list, this one was very heavy on communications training and support, and you'll hear that as a theme as I move through some of these other enterprise deployments as well. We delivered a lot of training for these folks. One of the things I thought was unique about Motorola has to do with their content migration strategy. So rather than moving everybody's stuff over for them, we call that server-side migration. Using um, In an Exchange world, you'd probably use the Google Apps Migrator for Microsoft Exchange tool from Google, also known as GAMI, or the Gamelin tool, which is Google Apps Migration for Lotus Notes. Um, Motorola took a little bit different approach. Um, they had users primarily self-serve migration. And I'll talk more about this a little bit later on when I get to different migration strategies. But certainly that was unique um, for Motorola. In these larger Google Apps deployments, we typically see more server-side or project team executed migrations than was the case with Motorola. Um, Genentech <clears throat> really calls out two different approaches for the deployment of Google Apps, one being um, often called a big bang or a um, all-in approach, right? So everybody's going to go live across the same very short period of time, generally a week, as opposed to a phased migration, right, which would happen generally by business group, sometimes by geography, lots of different reasons for doing a phased approach as well. Genentech actually had hybrid model. So we went live with calendar all at once, but they did a phased model for the mail um, portion um, of, their, um, of their deployment. Also very heavy use very early on of the collaboration side of Google Apps, which of course is docs and sheets and presentations and sites, et cetera. Um, that was accelerated certainly at Genentech and uh, been one of our, um, our largest and continues to be uh, one of the largest deployments out there. They've also done a lot of very unique things around their mobile solution strategy. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, Mead West Vaco. Um, this was a notes shop, so we see a lot of that. Um, people coming off of Lotus Notes as their legacy environment. Often don't see Lotus Notes well entrenched in the EDU space, um, but certainly elsewhere as well. Um, one of the things that's often the case, especially with Lotus Notes or others, is surrounding their messaging environment are you know, various applications. Notes is famous right, for their notes apps. Most of them are around workflow. Right, or, or um, across different policies and, and processes. Um, it's, it's worth knowing that besides just moving your messaging platform over right, for mail and calendar and then the docs piece as well, you need to pay attention to those workflow applications that may accompany mail and the integration of those into um, a Gmail or calendaring or, or wherever else as you move not just the people and their messaging content, over to Google Apps, but you also help them transition these workflow applications as well. Lastly, um, Johnson Diversity. This was about 14,000 users. Um, this was a big bang approach, a globally dispersed team. I think we had um, 19 locations around the globe, and we took the entire company live in a two-week period. Now, obviously, there's a lot of preparation that goes into that. The entire company went live at one time. To come back to a, that migration strategy I talked about earlier of a combination of server-side migration that's executed by the project team and self-serve migration where the users move their own content, 
Johnson diversity, I think, is more typical of what we see in the larger deployments, and there was a hybrid model, right? They moved a lot of the server-located content for users, but then had users using uh, Google Apps Up, um, um, uh, the Gamo tool or several of the other Google tools available to self-serve, move their own content. And again, I'll talk about this a little bit more later as I get into different content migration strategies uh, that we typically see in the enterprise. So my agenda today and what I want to talk about for our main time here is I want to talk about the four main focus areas that you generally see in any Google Apps deployment in the enterprise and are, I think are also very consistent with what we see in the EDU space as well as nonprofits. And then we'll talk about a lot of lessons learned from some of the deployments and dig a little bit deeper into some of the things I introduced that were unique to those six customers we talked about and share some best practices along the way. First, though, I want to talk about these four focus areas. We see this very consistently across pretty much every Google Apps deployment. You've always got project governance, the piece sitting in the center. Um, somebody's got to run the project. And a Google Apps deployment, although frankly a fairly easy project in you know, comparison to deploying SAP or, or other technologies, does require a reasonable amount of project governance. And I'll talk more about this and its importance in a few minutes. But a, a Google Apps deployment runs like any other IT project, right? It requires a reasonable amount of governance. Then the bottom two um, areas of this pyramid here are two of the technical areas, content migration and integration and interoperability. Simply put, content migration is moving people's stuff for them, right? Mail, calendar, contacts. But then there's also some kind of more broadly used elements like shared resources that need to be moved over as well. You probably have um, you know, either mail-in databases in the notes world or um, group folders, those kinds of things, shared calendars, permissions for them. So it's not just user content, right? It's really broader content to, as you move the entire solution over to Google. Integration and interoperability certainly comes in play in earlier phases in pilots where you have to make sure the two systems play nice together while you have a smaller audience in Google and the remainder in your legacy system. But once Google's fully deployed, some of the things that typically fall into integration and operability are things like directory sync, right? Maybe GBEZ um, to support mobile devices, um, other things like this. Lastly, and it really should be the largest piece of the triangle up here, um, is training, communications, and support. Typically, this is traditional organizational change management activity. And we found through a number of our largest deployments, this is actually the most important part of all. Because a move to Google Apps is not really a technology exercise. Right? The tools are well-founded, very easy to actually move the content over and set up some of these integration pieces as well. You run the project. What we're finding more um, uh, time and time again is it's really more of a change exercise. So move to Google is really more of a change exercise than a technical exercise. And this area is often underemphasized in a lot of the deployments that we see out there. We spend a lot more time on this than I think um, a lot of our customers expect, and it provides for a really great experience for users. I'll talk a lot more about this as I get a little bit deeper in. But first, I have a, a premise here. Um, so bear, run with me on this, and we'll see how it holds up. I think that deploying Google Apps is often similar to a symphony concert, right? Now, of course, that applies to the largest deployments. You're going to have a very large orchestra, and it could be down to a smaller project, you know, maybe only a quartet, but you've still got a lot of the same kinds of things. So let me draw some analogies here between the two. First of all, I want to spend a few minutes talking about the different roles that you're going to need attached to this project to ensure a successful deployment. The first would be a, the conductor of the orchestra, which I, I'm here characterizing as the project manager. You'll have first violin and woodwind section. These are the different engineering roles and other, other technical functions attached to the project. You've got facilities right, that make sure that network operations is going to support um, the change from you know, users with a client application going to an exchange or a note server that's on-premise instead going out to the cloud for the same content. So you need to have some network operations folks typically involved. You've got users, that your audience, right, that need a seat. So there's ticket sales involved with that. And of course, there's different roles within the audience as well, general users. Certainly some will be VIPs. 
But certainly in the EDU space, you've also got the kind of the student population and an alumni population in addition to what would normally just be faculty staff. So here's one place that an EDU deployment does differ from an enterprise deployment is typically in the EDU deployments, you provide less onboarding services, right, for students or alumni. Potentially, you don't even migrate their old content from the existing system, rather just stand up the account, maybe give them some self-serve tools to work on as well. One of the uh, larger EDU deployments that we're, uh, we're working on now, uh, getting ready to begin their deployment in the first quarter of next year, is um, NYU, one of the largest uh, universities out there. And with this one, I think, is a very characteristic of what we typically see in the EDU space, where we will be migrating the content for staff, um, uh, staff and faculty and, and people at that level. But when it comes to alumni and students, we're pretty much just creating the account, setting it up, providing self-serve tools where those people can selectively migrate the content that they want into their new accounts, um, and then training as a different experience for them as well. Typically, you're not going to conduct classroom-style training for alumni or students. Instead, a different modality for training delivery, like uh, recorded sessions and the like, are more appropriate there. Let's, let's spend a few minutes talking about each of these roles. So first, the conductor of the orchestra, most important player of all. right? That's the project governance layer. Generally, when it comes to Google Apps deployments, the project manager um, is responsible for kind of traditional project management stuff, right? Laying out the plan, making sure that it's executed you know, on time and on budget. But there's a few additional things as well that are worth considering when it comes to this, the conductor of the orchestra. You've got to make sure the sheet music is right and that every player knows their part. So that's simple project um, gathering requirements definition and success criteria. We often see um, you know, customers deciding, well, we're going to move to Google Apps, but what does it look like when we're done? Right? What are the success criteria around that way that we want to measure? Certainly, if you're doing a pilot in advance of your larger deployment, defining that success criteria and then gathering the results from the pilot are very key to, moving to, um, to determining what you need to do and what adjustments you need to make to move to the larger deployment. Certainly, the project manager sets the tempo for the orchestra, understanding the effort level required for each task. Got to make sure the orchestra is ready to go. All the roles that you need on your end are there. And then um, the conductor also creates dynamics, knowing what to emphasize or de-emphasize during the actual deployment phase. Other roles, other members of the orchestra that you're likely to see, your first violin is definitely going to be your messaging engineer. So the person who understands your legacy or source system right, to a, great, uh, to a very detailed level We'll also work with setting up the mail flow into the application, into Google Apps, and changing it from the mail flow that you've got today, passing through any necessary systems. Um, content migration, you're going to be working very closely with messaging engineering to extract the existing user content out, move it over to Google, so you need to make sure that the, the requirements are met there to do effective content migration. Sure, lots of um, planning requirements, gathering, etc often comes with that messaging person as well. There's a lots of other roles in the orchestra. You want to consider mobile solutions. We've seen in the enterprise space especially where we go into customers that have um, a kind of very heavily managed, um, you know, we're a BlackBerry shop. We've been using Bez forever. That's kind of top-down, very, um, you know, highly tightly managed device approach for mobile. Um, have taken the opportunity of a Google Apps deployment to broaden out their mobile offering. So now that Google offers tremendous support for Android, um, Windows Mobile iPhone devices, including device management um, policies, security policies, etc., a lot of customers have taken a move to Google Apps as a chance to move away from heavily managed mobile devices and open up the solution more broadly to others. Um, other important players in there, help desk and support. Uh, you've got, you can just deploy to users. You've got to be able to effectively support them immediately after deployment. There's a pretty good story around support where um, across the larger Google Apps deployments, you'll certainly see a bubble in the support requirements immediately after deployment. It's mostly made up of two things, how do I's right, and login issues. So depending on the approach that you've taken to authentication into Google Apps, you can really knock down a lot of the access issues around logins but you're left with a lot of how do I issues. Especially if your focus is the web UI of Google Apps, you can avoid 
a lot of the typical client issues with you know version problems, etc. As long as they've got a browser and it works, you can kind of eliminate that. In most of the larger deployments, we see a bubble of support immediately after the deployment, sometimes running a week or two. And I'll talk about some mitigation strategies for that. But the good news is, after um, Google Apps is fully deployed, we often see, certainly in the messaging space, um, help desk call volume drop down to be as little as a third of what it was previous to the Google Apps deployment. So from your legacy system onto Google Apps, you can expect a significant drop in help desk call volume because the tools are accessible, relatively easy to use. And again, if you're avoiding the client component and sticking with the web UI, which is the best user experience in Google Apps, um, the, the client side piece becomes very simple. It's just a browser and a network connection. Certainly, you're going to have a Google Apps system administrator, a guy that owns the system when it's done, often responsible for support escalations back and forth to Google. But unlike most on-premise systems where there's often a team of people taking care of you know, the Exchange servers and Note servers, etc., often post-deployment of Google Apps, the system administrator ends up being one or two people at most. Google's doing most of the work there. right? So it often falls to the system administrator to move some, from a away from more of a technical management role of the environment, because Google's doing a lot of that work, more towards um, change, what's coming from Google, how does it fit into your environment, how do you communicate that out to users. So certainly the sysadmin role changes uh, from uh, your legacy system to post-deployment. Oh, other roles out there, certainly one of the key ones is you've got an audience, right, for your orchestra, you've got an audience for your concert, you've got to have seats for them. So the directory services, whoever owns that system of record, that user management system of record uh, within your organization is a definitely a key player in the orchestra. Uh, it, typically here we'll use Google Apps Directory Sync so that you're only doing user management in one place, your existing system, and simply provisioning those users as well as the related attributes and data over into Google Apps. But you're going to work very closely with the person who owns your directory services to make sure that you've got a seat for every member of your audience. And then lastly, I mentioned this earlier, network engineering, making sure that all the participants have sufficient bandwidth and, and access to the Google Cloud. Often in the EDU space, you guys have typically have very tight firewalls um, to make sure that different segments of your population can't get to inappropriate content. So there's often a focus in EDU that I, that I don't often see in enterprise in making sure that we have the correct holes punched through right, so that users can effectively access all the portions of Google Apps. Now, again, continuing with this orchestra analogy, there are quite a few other players involved as well. Some of them, of course, stakeholders. Um, some of them system owners for other systems that need to integrate in. And a Google Apps deployment, especially on the messaging piece, is so pervasive. And we're talking about messaging, right? Mail and calendar. You've got to touch everyone. That you need to really understand everybody that is, in fact, in the orchestra. Often they're stakeholders, um, key players from different business groups, etc. But I, what, I guess what I would want to have as a key message here is even in the very largest Google Apps deployments, they're actually surprisingly easy to do. They're not um, difficult from a technical perspective. They're not unlike any other large IT project. But the one thing to always bear in mind with a Google Apps deployment, specifically on the messaging side, is it's very pervasive. You're going to touch every user, and you're going to impact the core systems that they use every single day mail and calendar, of course, being two of the primary examples of that. So you, know, you need to have the right size orchestra for your audience. It could be a quartet. It could be the full symphony. Let's talk about now about some best practices right, and lessons learned from some of these enterprise deployments. And if you've already deployed Google Apps to your organization, maybe you'll find, hear some things here that will resonate with you and, and um, kind of underscore some of the choices that you made earlier. Um, if nothing else, it gives some ideas on as you maybe roll Google Apps out more broadly to your organization on some different approaches. So first and foremost, and I've mentioned this earlier, um, we typically see most organizations lead with the messaging portion of Google Apps, right? So that's mail and calendar and instant messaging and the like, and follow up with the collaborative piece, docs, sheets, presentations, and sites, etc., as the finale, right? Often, for the larger deployments, messaging first, and then the, the collaborative side of Google Apps is uh, a grassroots almost adoption. Make it available, turn it on, educate users a little bit about what it does, 
And we find that the value in that approach is that it, it will find the right level within the organization, the people that can take best advantage of the collaborative abilities of docs and sheets and presentations will do so. But again, lead with messaging because it's so pervasive. You're going to touch everyone. Right? There's no, um, not a lot of room for error here. Right? If, if mail stops flowing, if people can't use the new system, um, you really break a lot of core things for any enterprise, any organization. So lead and stay focused on messaging. Collaboration is the frosting on the cake, though, and it actually will transform the way your organization works. The collaborative capabilities in doc sheets and presentations um, are, the, are a big deal. Um, on the messaging side, it's just mail and calendar, so it's not anything dramatic and revolutionary, but there's still change involved, which is my second point here. Right? A move to Google Apps is very much a change exercise and not a technical exercise. And towards this end, training is absolutely key. Let me talk just a few minutes about training and what we found to be very effective approaches in the larger organizations. Don't take in or waste any time conducting classes or doing training on what the buttons do in Google Apps. That's a good piece of advice there. Most users have some familiarity with Google and with Gmail. They, you know, some portion of them, a third often when I ask, already have a personal Gmail account. Even failing that, they, most people can figure out what the Compose Message button does. So don't spend a lot of time on that on training. Instead, where we found to be very effective is Train instead at more of a, a at higher level that helps people transition their personal workflows from one tool to another. Right? So it's not the mechanics of how the tool works, but they've got personal workflows built up around your existing system. And so even understanding the mechanics of how you know, Gmail works from the interface, it's moving those personal workflows over that's often the most challenging for users. So, so we prefer to focus the training there. Uh, both with an initial blast of training as well as follow-up sessions. We call them open QAs or open forums, um, immediately after deployment and for several weeks after to give users a place to simply come back and ask those kinds of questions that are necessary to help them move those workflows over. I cannot underemphasize or overemphasize how important training communications um, is to the success of a Google deployment. Bear in mind that some segments of your users are, in fact, VIPs. Make sure they've got those box seats right in the audience, and many of them will require some additional focused training. For example, for the executive audience within an enterprise deployment, often we find the best way to train them is one-on-one. -on -one. Get an hour on their calendar. Go to their office. Show them the essentials of what they need to know. Make sure that their mail and calendar is delegated to the admin sitting outside the room, their mobile device is set up. Thank them for their time and hit the road the next one. Lastly on here, administrative assistants are absolutely key to a successful Google Apps deployment. These uh, particular segment of users, and every organization has them, weren't necessarily hired for their technical acumen. They're hired for their organization skills. But they go deeper and use these tools far more than the average user does. But they often do it by rote. They just know to schedule a meeting. I go here, I click here, I type here, and then I do it again. Um, so they're going to need the most help transitioning those workflows that they have over to a different tool set. Moreover, in most organizations, the administrative assistants are a very vocal audience and by extension very influential. Right? We found that extra time and love and attention focused for administrative assistants filters out certainly to the executives that they support as well as the remainder of the, of the organization. Ignore the administrative assistants um, at your own peril. Um, that we'll put, uh, we found time and time again that focused time and attention, additional training, support hotlines, etc., for administrative assistance are really key in a successful Google Apps deployment. Pilots are, are uh, um, we see so many different approaches. Um, so for those of you who haven't deployed Google Apps yet and are considering maybe doing a pilot, here's just a little bit of guidance on a pilot. Keep it quick. Keep it very focused. Figure out exactly what it is you're trying to determine in your pilot. Because pilot is an oft misused word that for some people means a tire kicking exercise to determine if Google Apps is even a fit for the organization, all the way down to, well, it's really a dress rehearsal right, for conducting this the symphony. So figure out what it is you need to measure in a pilot and do that and only that. One thing about pilots 
that um, is a, a messy pilot is a good pilot. A pilot that runs a little too clean makes me really nervous. A messy pilot means we have figured out or at least identified all of the issues, all the challenges that we'll have in the larger deployment, and I have a chance to address those before we, we go more broadly. But because a pilot is often messy, choose your pilot participants carefully. Generally, you don't want executives and administrative assistants in a pilot audience. You want people that are going to be Google guides that will help, help move the rest of the organization over. So certainly you'll pick your core team, right, your, the, the core of your audience, but make sure that you've got representation across various different business groups, etc. But balance that with the need to keep a pilot quick and focused. When it comes to user content migration, there's a, an approach that we use in the enterprise and we use in larger ed education, EDU deployments as well, that's worked really well for us. Plan to do user content migration in two passes. A simple example will illustrate, if my users are going to go live a month from now, I can begin migrating their content today so that I can do it on off hours and, and limit the impact right, to my production messaging servers. And then I can do a second pass right before they go live. Um, think of it as a delta migration, where I'm simply going to refresh the attributes of any content I've already moved over, get any new stuff, and make sure that users' mailboxes on day one looks ex exactly and is in the same state in Google as it was when they left the legacy system. So it's not necessary to cram all of the, the migration activity into that three-day weekend before go live. Um, instead, just know that you can do it slowly over time with a refresh run right at the end. Lastly on this one, a user provisioning into Google Apps using the Google Apps Directory Sync or other technologies is only going to be as good as your source system data. Typically in enterprise and larger deployments, a fair amount of activity goes in cleaning up right, the LDAP um, Active Directory, the user repository, before you use Directory Sync to provision those users over. Bear in mind also, Google Apps Directory Sync will bring over not just the essential elements of user data, first name, last name, and the like, but it's also going to bring over those extended attributes as well, office location and phone number. There's a long list of fields that you can populate over. Um, done correctly, you'll end up with a really terrific global address list in Google that's synchronized from your source system, necessitating you to only do user management in one place. A little bit more on communications here. I call it, um, uh, keeping with my theme here, printed programs right, are essential right, if for your audience members. Really, again, I want to emphasize here that communications training and support is, is the biggest piece often of any Google Apps deployment. To be sure, you've got technical work to do with the integration pieces and uh, the content migration, but that's actually really easy stuff. Um, it's the communications piece as you move your organization and the users within it from one to another that's key. Communications as a first part is actually pretty easy. It's just a matter of telling users what's coming and when and how it impacts them. If you can't get the relevance message, why I care about it, across with your communication mechanism, you're, you're not going to reach your user. So communicate often, communicate frequently, communicate concisely, right? to let people know what's coming and when, and set appropriate expectations. Another good trick is to use Google Apps to deploy Google Apps. Certainly for an organization that's unfamiliar with the technology, we found that having the core team that's doing the deployment work, the orchestra in my example, begin using Google Apps very early in the process, and then use Sheets. There's some great project management tools and Gantt chart plugins and other things for Sheets and Docs and, and the like. We usually and always create a Google site, put all of the project content in there. Number one, it's a great set of tools and a good way to organize your project, but moreover, it gets people familiar with the tools early on. This core team of people, right, certainly pilot users as well, that will end up being your Google guides leading the rest of the organization. And then my last point here is, having done a lot of these now, is have fun with it. A Google Apps deployment in every organization, with few exceptions that I've been involved with, is a very positive experience. Your users will be very excited by this. So have a lot of fun with it. Um, I used a couple musical analogies here, but you're basically playing some very light, fun music that's going to be attractive to lots of people. And it's not one of those oppressive, uh, dark uh, concerts. 
um, again, continuing with my analogy here, have fun with it. Uh, we found that very simple things, uh, for example, with Brown University, we had what we called a G-Day. It was a go-live day, and it really was more of an event. Yes, we did a lot of training and other things as well, but it was very much an event evangelizing the solution and generating excitement, and worked very well. Certainly, we see it in the larger EDUs as well as the enterprise space. Do what you can to have fun with this. A Google Apps deployment um, should be clean and easy, quite successful. A lot of people have gone down this road and have very successful deployments and are reaping the benefits of it, but have fun doing it along the way. So let me stop there, and um, let's see what uh, kind of questions we have. Uh, Jason? Great. Well, thanks, everyone. Uh, just a reminder, if you have uh, questions for Brad, just ping them through me through the uh, chat window. Um, one thing someone had asked, um, actually, before I get to the question, I, I just, uh, uh, speaking from a marketing standpoint, I just want to echo the the uh, the last bit about having uh, having fun with deployments. I mean, that's that's one of the things I have seen that's the most effective in terms of uh, driving kind of excitement and awareness on campuses is, is when um, when there is an element of, of fun to the to the marketing communications. Um, that go out. So we've seen things, for instance, uh, NC State did a, you know, they, they painted out a commonly used uh, tunnel on campus with uh, kind of fun sort of uh, graffiti style, uh, you know, Google Docs is, is, is coming and, and stuff like that. So that always works well. Um, so one thing that was asked pretty early on, you, I think you mentioned briefly migrating from uh, meeting, meeting Maker. Do, can you provide any background on, on uh, Meeting Maker migrations? Sure. So um, Meeting Maker is an, an kind of an odd tool. We see it broadly used across certainly EDUs, and I've run into it in three or four of them now, um, and not so much used outside of um, educational space. Um, it's, it's a very effective tool. A lot of people have been using it for a while. The key to doing Meeting Maker migrations is um, an, uh, an API-level access that's available um, for Meeting Maker that lets you extract the content out. Very briefly, any migration tool, whether it's Google's or some of the ones that we've built, where one we're building for Meeting Maker for NYU, for example, has two parts. Right? It has an extractor and an inserter. So you've got to extract the content out, and typically with any calendaring solution, Meeting Maker included, you're going to bring things out to ICS files. From there, the inserter will grab those once they're read in a file structure and move them over to Google. The key to a clean calendar migration, though, it often hinges upon the, the source application's ability to export clean ICS files. Calendaring can be really tricky when it comes to migration. Mail is easy. It's just text and a header and an attachment. Calendars, we find, uh, we, we try to shoot for a success rate in uh, around the low to mid-90s, knowing that there will always be some fallout in calendar migrations because of odd things like um, recurring meetings with an exception pattern. Um, you know, there's, there's a, uh, where meetings span different time zones, for example. There's always a small portion of fallout. Um, for meeting maker migrations, um, the key is, um, again, to extract the content out uh, using a meeting maker's API um, to a, a file structure, right, an array, and then import it using um, direct API access um, into Google Apps from there. By the way, very large-scale calendar migrations can be done in a very brief period of time. Uh, because the content isn't large, it's just complicated. So if you've got the right tools in place, I think a good example was Lawrence Berkeley Labs, where we moved um, everyone's calendar. I think it was on the order of about 8,000 people's calendars, um, and every element of content in it, including uh, room and resource reservations and the like, uh, the entire execution of the migration took, I think, a little over eight hours to move every scrap of calendaring over there. So it's very doable. Meeting Maker's a little tricky, the key is being able to extract its content out to that ICS file structure. Great. Um, another question someone asked, uh, you know, can you expand, you, you mentioned firewall problems, I think, very briefly. Can you expand on the kind of the firewall problems that you, you see most, most often in education? Any examples? Um, so one of my uh, current projects is a school district of Palm Beach County. Um, so this is a K-12 through institution uh, representing I think a little over 40 different um, campuses um, and schools in, uh, in Palm Beach, Florida. They had um, a, a firewall system that's you know, designed to ensure that no one can get to anything you know, that's um, um, any dangerous content. And to that end, they, have, they had really gone through and locked down access to even personal Gmail accounts. 
um, only very desi- you know, dedicated and designated systems um, was firewall access allowed to. What we found as we started to bring Google Apps in place was they would punch individual holes through for you know, mail itself or for calendar itself. Um, but that doesn't cover you know, the, the URLs and things that you need to go to, for example, to watch a video right, uh, with training or to get help or any of the uh, ancillary or related components of Google Apps um, required punching separate holes through. And um, so it's just a matter of thinking about um, what's necessary from your p- firewall to make sure that you know, people can get to not just the core Google Apps, but all of the associated and related collateral like training and help and, and those other systems that are so necessary going along with it. Just, I guess my advice would be spend some time on this early on so that you're not um, in reactive mode having to punch yet another hole through when you find some other piece um, uh, that, of, uh, of the Google environment that users aren't going to be able to access. Great. Uh, someone else was asking about Cisco Unity. Is there a way that um, Cisco can be integrated with Google Apps to allow voicemail to go to Google Apps email? Is that something you guys have ever done? Um, yes. Um, there's a great third-party product out there from a company called Esnatech. That's E-S-N-A-T-E-C-H. They're a Google Apps partner. Um, we focus primarily on deployments and, and kind of holistic approaches to solution. Esnatech, on the other hand, focuses exclusively on unified communications. And they've got a really great story around Cisco um, uh, Unity. Um, definitely worth taking a look. Um, it's, a, it's a great product and integrates quite cleanly um, into Google Apps itself with all of the things that you would expect um, from a unified communication system, you know, email, um, you know, and, and um, you know, the, it integrates into Google Talk for its presence component, uh, let you, you know, with messages being delivered. It's, it's really quite a great system. Suggest you look at that as a third-party solution, either augmenting or potentially replacing your Cisco Unity piece. Great. Um, and then a couple questions kind of in the, in the training bucket. Uh, you know, how, you, you speak about, um, about training. Like how, how do you normally deliver training? Is it a classroom style? Is it WebEx? You know, what's, what's kind of the effort and scale of what you do? And then also if you just speak to, you know, what are some of the more uh, creative or more successful training materials that, that um, you, you, you feel you've produced or that you've seen uh, universities that you've worked with produce? Sure. There's lots of different approaches to training, uh, and I guess we've seen everything, um, you know, certainly lots of different modalities for delivering the content, but also different approaches ranging from a train-the-trainer model all the way down to large auditoriums, right, um, filled with people in instructor-led classroom-style training. Um, let me give you a few tips sprinkled around training and some of the things we found that work and don't work. Um, Often a, a, an approach to Google Apps training or any a technology deployment training is, well, we need to have kind of exercises. People bring their laptops. They work through some exercises. We find that, frankly, of, of little value, um, especially when you're leading with the messaging piece. Mail is mail, right? I mean, okay, it's a different system doing it, but at the end of the day, it does the same functions, right? Mail comes in. It goes out. You attach files, calendars. You know, you create calendar items. I mean, the, the fundamentals of the tools are not radically different because at the end of the day, it's still a mail and a calendaring tool. So we find that, you know, the need to come in and do um, you know, exercises and really de- carefully define content um, as you lead people through it has very little value. Um, the best results we've had from training is a lecture demo format. So bring people into a room, get them away from their desk, get them into a room, um, do some knowledge transfer to them on not what the buttons do, again, but some fundamental differences between the two tools. And a simple example of that. In the Outlook world, everything is focused around folders, right? Everybody's got tons and tons of folders, and your users will have foldered things for a long, long time. And really, they do it to find stuff. That's why you folder things, is to find stuff. With previous versions of Outlook, certainly newer versions are better, but in previous versions of Outlook, the search function and capability was very limited and, frankly, really slow, to the point that most users abandoned search as a model for mail management a long time ago. Now, when you bring them over to the Google world, of course, it's all about search in Gmail. Um, in fact, we find that post-deployment, users will abandon foldering and labeling after a few months or so once they really understand and take, start to take advantage of the search capability. 
So again, it's not about what the buttons do, but explaining to people how the experience and how managing mail in the Gmail world or with Google Calendar is very different from their legacy tools. That should be the focus of the training. You know, what the buttons do type of training is available in a whole series of videos that Google's got out there um, on the user deployment sites and adoption sites and scattered around YouTube. So that, that very basic kind of what the buttons do training is certainly very available. Just go to Gmail, click on Help, choose Video um, Overview, and you know, users can watch um, and, and work through some things that will show them the essentials. Focus your training instead on the stuff that's the highest value add. Right, how these tools are going to be used in your organization with very specific use cases. And again, focus on the fundamental differences between the two. Right? Search as a mail management model instead of foldering. Focus on, the, on labeling versus foldering and how those, two, how those work differently. Uh, conversation threads is very new to a lot of people, depending upon the legacy system you're coming off of. I mean, certainly other tools uh, messaging tools are, are, are adopting conversation threads more broadly now, but that's really core to Google, helping people understand how that works and how archiving works. Again, these are principles around using Gmail, and the same thing as applied to Calendar. They're very different from the legacy system. So focus your training on that. In terms of, of modalities for delivering training, recorded sessions are fine, but um, you know it's tough to get people to go sit and watch a long video. Um, so break those up into smaller snippets. Put them on a user adoption site, a Google site, and have users work it from there. We've had great success doing webinar-based training as well, but the interactivity level is pretty low, so make sure you follow up with lots of those open QA sessions that I mentioned earlier. I prefer, honestly, for training, instructor-led training. Get people away from their desk, get them into a room or an auditorium, do as many as you can at a time, and do really focused training have them, uh, the last key point about training is never deliver training too early or too late. Ideally, you want users to go to a class, get the information they need, go back to their desk, and immediately start using it. Too much time elapses, you've really wasted your time in training. Or if training comes too late, users are already frustrated right, as they're trying to adapt these personal workflows to a different tool, and it, you know, you've put the cart behind the horse, in front of the horse. So those are some guidance around training. Oh, that's great, helpful. Thanks. Go ahead. Um, so another question. You know, recently we, we made a change with Google Apps where your Google Apps account can now be used to access uh, a whole slew of new services like Blogger, Picasa, Reader, and so on. Um, have you uh, dealt with this this infrastructure change? Have you gone back to any any clients and done additional training, or, or how do you how do you see your clients uh, working with these new services? Um, a lot of it depends on, on the customer and the service that they're going to. Um, you know, often um, the, the, the individual users have a need for, say, Reader or, or, or you know, one of these kind of, I'm calling them the ancillary Google Apps. They already, they already know that tool. They just want it joined right, to their primary account. So it's often just a matter of ID management, right? joining that particular service into the Google Apps domain. And, um, so that they can log in and, and begin using it there. So I haven't yet seen the need to go back and do a lot of focused training around that because generally users know those tools. They've asked for them, um, which is why they've been joined into the domain. Great. Another question uh, regarding, uh, you know, you mentioned the difference between audiences like students and faculty and staff. How do you see uh, universities approaching the problem? Do you see a lot of uh, universities uh, doing faculty, staff, students at the same time? Do you see them revisiting it soon after? Um, I've seen both approaches. Um, typically, though, that's where phased approach um, comes in with an EDU deployment. Um, I'll give you an example. With NYU, um, we've actually got four phases that span um, a space of just a few months to do their entire deployment for over 80,000. Of course, the majority of those are students, about 10,000 faculty and staff, and then a large alumni population as well. So what we're doing there is a pilot early on with a small group of only about 100 users. Again, the pilot's very focused. Um, it's just a matter of more focus, I think, on, the, on their pilot around um, growing their own internal knowledge for people we call Google Guides, right, sprinkled across the organization that will help lead the rest of the organization on. Immediately after that, uh, we're bringing um, the alumni population live because there's some key dates around that. 
but it's really not much more than provisioning the accounts and providing self-service tools and support for the alumni population. Later on, um, roughly about four weeks later, uh, we're doing the, uh, the staff and faculty. Um, for all 10,000, it should span about one week's worth of activities. And then our plan is in the very following week to, to instantiate the student accounts as well. It's worth noting on the student accounts that it's little more than creating the account, standing it up, making sure they have access to it through uh, your identity management system or whatever mechanism for authentication you've done, and then students are off and running it on their own. So I've seen smaller universities um, certainly do all of them at the same time. Uh, it's a very viable approach. Just recognize that there are different audiences, right? So your content migration approach, your training approach can, in fact, should be, likely will be, very different for these different audiences. Great. Um, another question regarding regarding Outlook. Do you see, uh, you know, do people, a lot of people can continue to use MS Outlook as a, as a client to access the Google Apps email, or do you, do you see people uh, kind of quickly move, move to the browser? And, and for those who are using Outlook, um, you know, how, how do you configure that across the board? Sure. So, of course, Google provides a tool called the Google Apps Sync for Microsoft Outlook. Right? This is a MAPI-based plug-in for Outlook um, that goes way beyond just a simple IMAP connection of the like that you would see with um, Entourage or you know, Apple Mail or, or Thunderbird or other client-type tools out there. It's very tempting for a lot of our customers to think, well, we're just going to move the Exchange engine, right, the back end. We'll move that over to Google and let everybody continue to use Outlook against the Google back end. Very tempting approach because you think, well, then you know, it will minimize the need for training. You know, there won't be a lot of change. Everybody will continue to use the same tools. We found time and time again it's actually really not the best approach. The best way to use Google Apps is through the browser. That's where all the goodness is, right, all the goodies and all the things that will ultimately transform the way groups of people within your organization work. But, and then moreover, to really recognize the full ROI, financial and otherwise around Google Apps, you need to get people off of this client, you know, kind of old school client approach, um, you know, with offline capabilities in Google Apps, um, certainly across mail and calendar, the need to continue to use a client solution really comes down to change, right, a reluctance on the part of users to change. We find that certainly through the training and communications piece, evangelizing the use of the web UI as the preferred access mechanism um, does a really good job. Anecdotally, though, in some of the larger deployments, we often see them uh, begin with the idea that maybe half of our audience are going to continue to use Outlook. And then as we get closer to the deployment and this communication and evangelization that's taking place through training, we see a large segment of those people that, uh, abandon it. A good example is Avago Technologies, um, one of our earlier Google Apps deployments. Uh, they've been live a little over two years now. Initially, they planned to continue to use a lot of Outlook. Um, as we moved through the project and began to go live, ended up with about 20% of the people planning to use Outlook. Um, not three or four months later, they were down to only about 5% continuing to use Outlook, and now today there's probably only a handful of holdouts. What generally happens is the user experience from the web UI is so superlative that as long as you're training people effectively on it and evangelizing the goodness that is the web UI, people will in time abandon even well-entrenched clients um, like Outlook. So again, Google has great capability for using Outlook as that client solution right, against a Google backend, but it's really only half the experience. Uh, the far, far away the better approach is to use the web UI. With that approach, you uh, recognize more ROI, you can end up life more clients. Certainly it's a lot easier on your help desk because they're not supporting a, a whole litany of client solutions anymore. There's nothing easier than a browser and an internet connection. One of the things, I, too, that I think makes a move to the web UI compelling for people that are very married to their client is the, the, the ubiquity of the solution. By complete platform independence, I can get to all of my stuff from any kind of machine, um, you know, mobile device or the like, uh, really will start to unhook people um, from, their, uh, from their outlook tendencies. But there's no question that's a tough one, and you need to spend appropriate amount of time evangelizing that solution as a preferred approach to using Google Apps. Well, great. Uh, I see that we're bumping up against time, so I did want to uh, just 
make one announcement, which is that I will be emailing uh, all registrants and, and attendees to this uh, conference uh, a link to a video or recording of, of this WebEx. Um, that will probably go out, I'm, I'm guessing, Tuesday of next week. So you'll be able to view uh, this seminar as well as, uh, as the other three we ran this week. Um, I would like to hear back from you folks um, about any uh, feedback you have on this session or uh, ideas for topics that you'd like to see uh, us do to continue this conversation in 2011. So once again, my email is cook, C-O-O-K, at google.com. Uh, Brad, I think we have time for just uh, one last question. Um, someone was asking a bit about um, single sign-on and, and, and the web UI. Can users use their computer login credentials to, to log into to the web UI? So that's, that's actually a long question, right? Or, or, or a simple question that actually has a long answer. There's lots of different ways to authenticate into Google Apps. At its very simplest, it's just a separate Google credential, right? Was what most people start with. I'm going to go over to Google. I'm going to log in with this ID and this password. It's not synchronized from the source or anything else. Single sign-on with you know federated authentication via SAML, a very attractive model, works very well with Google Apps, but only really works with the web UI. So if you've got people bringing in a litany of mobile devices or want to continue to use some legacy client um, solution, Thunderbird and, and the like, um, you're going to have to go beyond just single sign-on, and, um, and, and they're going to log in. Single sign-on is, by its very nature, limited to um, the web experience only. So what we often see in the larger deployments is a combination of federated authentication with single sign-on, SAML solution, as well as a password synchronization so that, that you still have the user ID over in Google with a password that's unidirectionally synchronized from your source system, Active Directory or the like, so that if I'm using the web, great, I'm single sign-on to in, which can be set up to say, hey, I'm already on, on the network, don't prompt me again, or I'm coming in from grandma's house with the web, you've got to prompt me for my network login and, and potentially an additional factor, right, a multi-factor authentication like a secure ID token or the like. But then also with uh, mobile devices and other types of access points, certainly with clients as well, having them the, use a, a password to get into Google that is synchronized unidirectionally from the source system makes life a lot easier there. Password reset done in Active Directory, of course, flows over to Google. We call that same sign-on because when you log into Google, you're logging in with the same login credential um, that you would into the network or any other places. So it, often we see a combination of single sign-on federated authentication and a password sync solution so that you can have either both single and same sign-on, which you choose um, is usually determined by your client approach. Great. Uh, Brad, thank you uh, once again for joining. Uh, that was uh, very helpful. I'll probably always think of deployments as symphonies from now on. Um, and uh, thank you, everyone, for dialing in. And once again, please uh, don't hesitate to, to let us know what kind of topics you would like covered in the future.